Hey there, beautiful people. Welcome to Fanti, the podcast for all those complex and complicado conversations about the gray areas in our lives. I am absolutely your mom's favorite and maybe your dad's too, Jarrett Hill. Well, how you doing? Okay. And I am entertainment journalist, editor, author, rest of We See Each Other, a Black Trans Journey Through TV and Film, out May 9th, Trayvell Anderson. <laughs> Coming up on the show to die, we're going to talk about the degendering of award show categories. That'll be fun and interesting um, because I'm sort of kind of an expert. I don't know if you've heard about that, Jarrett. Did you like go to school for that? <laughs> um, I- <laughs> yeah, I, well, I did a little something, something, maybe not for that per se. I am a sociologist by training. Okay. Stop trying to play me. Okay? Well, I mean, there's always a stand for reference, like right around the corner. So I just want to make sure we get it in there. It's coming. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> but first we are going to get in our first segment. We have a tough question for you all. The first tough question of the season. Take it away, Jarrett. Yeah, so it's award season, and for us here in LA, that means that we're going to a lot of awards events, and whether they're awards nights themselves or the receptions that precede or follow them, there are a lot of things to attend and a lot of outfits to wear. So more specifically, I Mm -hmm. mean that there's a lot of outfits to fit into or to like be like hugged in or, you know, whatever it is, depending on how you get down and what you're going to be wearing. This weekend, Travell and I attended Better Brothers Los Angeles' Truth Awards, and I almost didn't go because, one, I've had no time off in the last Mm -hmm. few weeks. And to be clear, these are fully work events. I know that they're cute and there's great pictures and all that shit, but, like, these are work events, right? A bitch is worn down after three days with no time off. But I also didn't feel like I had something to wear that I'd feel good in. And then I told myself that I'd regret it if I didn't go. I wanted to be supportive and all of those things. And I started seeing what the closet had to offer, right? I was like, what can we give the girls just in case I feel like going? I told Travel I wasn't going. I was like, you know what, sis? This ain't it for me today. I just, I'm going to sit at home and chill. Mm -hmm. And I also went into the closet and started thinking about like the weight fluctuation that's happened over the last few months has gone up 15 pounds has come back down and you know things fit differently so i found a suit in the closet and i was like oh this this is cute i i've worn this but it's not been photographed so i could get away with it but it's a slim suit like it's a <laughs> it's a slim cut athletic fit or whatever they call that shit right and you know with with slim shit, like with stuff that is fitted, honey, that 10, 15 pounds can make a big difference, right? And so I thought to myself, like, mm-hmm. I have had this rule with myself that I was not going to start shapewear. I was going to, like, love my body and embrace my body and be like, it oh, is okay. what it is and all of that. And then I thought, well, if I want this suit to feel comfortable, it might be helpful, Right. I've not had any shapewear Mm -hmm. and I had a friend over and I was like, I asked her, I was like, are you familiar with shapewear? Like, how do, how does this work? We ended up going to the store and I got something and put it on and like tried it. And I was like, I kept having this question for myself. Like, is shapewear inherently fat phobic? Because y'all dragged me on the show before about Mm. being fat phobic with my own damn self. Mm. And I've been like questioning this the entire time. So I wanted to bring this to the the conversation and get y'all's perspective on this. Travell, what do you think? So the question is, is shapewear inherently fat phobic? Yes. Um, Before you answer that, um, hold on. Hold on. All right. Do you have you tried shapewear? What is your philosophy there before we get to the fat phobic piece? I I have um tried a wear of shape um once or twice before. Um particularly when I, you know, when I used to be trying to, you know, slide myself into the bodycon dresses and I didn't want, you know, my my <laughs> stomach, you know, uh to 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 protrude. Um but a lot of shapewear right is about contouring one's body it's about restricting and constricting one's body which i feel like based on all of the you know 
education that I have gleaned from all of the folks, you know, dedicated to this particular work, that type of thinking might, you know, have a little little fat phobia in it wrapped up. That's in how it, I right? felt. Because, like, yeah. Our bodies are our bodies. Yeah. So, you know, I think I th- but it makes me think of Lizzo and her uh, Yiddy uh, line, which, which is not is available at the mall, as, as I found out. <laughs> Maybe you at the wrong mall. I don't know. I was. Um, I was at Fox Hills. But it's too black over here for like shapewear <laughs> and shit like that. It just was not happening. But, you know, her brand is called Shapewear, but I remember reading an article where she was talking about, like, the business behind it and how she wanted to call it bodywear, but, you know, the the market and the understanding of what bodywear is versus shapewear um, just wasn't something that was tested out. So it's called Shapewear, but her whole thinking around it is not about constricting or, you know, shaping one's body in a particular way that might, you know, be deemed more attractive or whatever, you know, her kind of ethos of the company is around just like loving yourself, loving your body, but supporting it with these types of garments as opposed to constricting it. So I, to answer the question about is shapewear inherently fat phobic, I, I wonder how much of it is about, you know, why, why we're using it, the purposes behind it and like kind of the, the internal conversations, if that makes sense. Speaking of internal conversations, once you put something like that on and then you got to go like put on a pant, button it, put on a jacket and then go like somewhere, sit in a car, be in a seat and then eating, honey, it was a lot. Um, It wasn't uncomfortable. It wasn't, it wasn't like I hated it, but it was definitely something where I was like, I don't want to do this all the time. Like it just didn't feel great. Um, But I mean, it worked. I I can show y'all the photo. Um, I did not get a good photo in my outfit on Saturday. I realized that after I got home. So this is a bad photo in my mirror. Um, that hasn't been cleaned off, but this is what I wore. So. I just want to say, at least now you know what Black women, well, not just Black women, but women in fems go through to 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 adhere to all of these horrible beauty standards that y'all I, make I mean, us have to live up to. I, I've watched <laughs> Oprah my whole life. I've heard these conversations. I just haven't had the experience. Um, But I do remember thinking, like, I went to Fox Hill. We went to various different um, stores at the mall. And it was hard to actually find. And I remember thinking, like, there's nothing here for men, um, like, in the men's area. But, like, also, I was going, like, I went over to the women's section. And, like, some of the stores didn't have it there. And I was starting to think, like, oh, my God, is this my Nina Parker moment? Like, is this, is this my Uh, moment to, like... To to be like, you know, I found oh. a gap in the in the system, but then literally the <laughs> next day, without searching for it on my phone, like Twitter was like, "Are you looking for men's shapewear?" And I was like, "Bitch, first of all, fuck you, Twitter. Uh. Number two, no, because I got mine. But number three, <laughs> like it's apparently not my Nina Parker." <laughs> but yes, I do. I do think to to finally answer that question, I do, I do think that shapewear is 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 fat phobic inherently um and even though folks like lizzo are trying to reclaim it right and redefine it um our body our body your body is your body i will say i have gotten very comfortable with you know my little my little stomach hanging out you know uh or protruding in a dress because guess what that's the body i got and this is a strong body baby okay and if you don't like the way you show up honey then you don't like strength because this 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 body does whatever I need her to do. Okay, let me let me calm down. All right, I was gonna say right, that's about to take a left hand turn break. at any moment, and I just want to like <laughs> go ahead on and move forward. Coming up after we pay these bills, we are gonna get into the growing conversation about the degendering of award shows, and I've got one of the industry's best insiders to uh, give you some perspective. Let us know what you thought about this conversation on social media. Fan size coming right back. <laughs> Sit down, have a seat, ma'am. Yes, I am the insider. I just want you know.
Oh, yes, honey, spring is about to sprung, okay? And there's nothing quite like a fresh start. And what better time to freshen things up inside your home as well? Brooklinen has the home essentials that you need to step up your space and step into the new season. Brooklinen's classic and lux sheets, all right, are made to meet the needs of hot and cold sleepers and always look as good as they feel. They work directly with suppliers, so you never get caught in the middle when it comes to getting the highest quality materials. And if you're looking to elevate your space and your rest and relaxation style, Brooklinen has you covered with their luxurious super plush towels and robes that bring the spa home to you. We have talked before about our Brooklinen goods, our sheets, pillowcases, duvet covers. Mm -hmm. What did you get? Mm-hmm. I got I got the entire set, honey. And then you, guess what? I liked it so much, I went back and bought more, okay? Well, if you want to act like Travel, you can shop online at brooklinen.com <laughs> for a home refresh at its best. For a limited time, get $20 off, plus free shipping on orders of $100 or more with code FANTI. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, code FANTI for $20 off. And to all the LA folks, come see and feel the comfort in real life. You can now shop Brooklyn in sheets, towels, and more in person at their Santa Monica store. Welcome back, beautiful people. We're going to get into our Fanti. Award season is slowly but surely going gender neutral, or so it seems that way. You know, this past weekend, the Independent Spirit Awards became the latest award show to hand out trophies in gender neutral acting categories. This was the first year doing so for the group. Instead of Best Actress, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actress, and Best Supporting Actor, etc., they opted simply for Best Lead and Best Supporting Performances with total 10 total nominees each for film and TV. There was also a gender neutral breakthrough performance award, but each category had just one winner. Three out of the four total major categories went to women and host Hassan Minhaj even said during his opening monologue that the move was great, quote, because for the first time in history, all the men will know how all the women feel when they find out they're competing with Kate Blanchett. Now, the Spirit Awards' move to gender-neutral categories follows in the footsteps of other award shows, the Gotham Awards and MTV Movie and TV Awards among them, which went gender-neutral with their categories in recent years. And much of the discourse for these decisions in recent memory have been in response to greater calls for inclusion of especially non-binary folks, right? Sam Smith, for example, called out the Brits in 2021 for not having a place for them to be represented in the awards even though, right, they had previously won an award from the group when they used he, him pronouns. Then in 2022, the Brits went gender neutral. But the debate around gendered categories at award shows is much older than, you know, this new age. Back in 2012, for example, before we were talking in mass about gendered categories and their exclusion of non-binary artists, the Recording Academy, those are the people who do the Grammys, announced a sweeping overhaul of their setup, including the removal of all gendered categories. Despite this, many questions for whatever reason, still remain for lots of folks about this idea of degendering award show categories. And so we are going to give it the Fanti treatment today. But to get us started, Mr. Hill, I'm putting you on the spot because this was not here when we produced the episode before. FYI, I know. I, I just saw what like, is oh, your... we're doing this. <laughs> Keep you on your toes. Uh -huh. okay. What is your favorite award show moment? What comes to mind most immediately when I say award shows? With my favorite, the first moment that comes to mind when I'm put on the spot like this um, would be the Academy Awards. <laughs> like it's for a long time, I've had this like dream in my mind of hosting the Academy Awards, specifically the 100th Academy Awards um, in 2028. Um, what I, number we at? We're at 96, I think, 95, something like that this year. All right. So y'all know what to do. Run it up. We got time. We got time. Right. We we working it. We got time. Um, It wasn't <laughs> a specific win that I really enjoyed. I appreciated the presentation. Um, about, like, I think it was like 2012, 2013. Um, the, it was, I know specifically Hugh Jackman and Anne Hathaway were a part of that open. I think they hosted that year. But what I loved was... Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, For the uh, actor awards, they had previous winners come out and present the awards. So like for best actress or best supporting actress, it's, you know, Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah Winfrey and like all these different people come down and like they talk about each of the, the nominees and their work and like what was so fantastic about their performance. Um, And then they announce the winner and the person comes up and is kind of like welcomed into this club of Oscar winners. And I just thought it was a really beautiful way to do it. As a producer, it gave me anxiety because I was like, this is a really long way to do it. But that's my favorite like award show um, kind of uh, moment that comes to mind first. What about you? You know what's funny about this? I'm going to give you my answer in three seconds. But what's funny about this is based on our two examples of like the the award show moments that came to mind most for us y'all will be able to get a good idea of just how interesting this this friendship is because I'm the now award I'm show moment that i'm going with <laughs> the award show moment that i'm going with is um the bet awards Hosted by a one Monique. Okay? Oh my God. Which, yes. <laughs> yes. You I know, know exactly it. You what know this it. is. You know it. Absolutely. When Monique hosted, uh, she hosted twice and she did uh, uh, this Beyonce so inspired dance. There was a little uh, Usher uh, tribute and she had all of these, you know, big girl dancers behind. Before the original before big girl. Before Lizzo. Yes. Listen, <laughs> before Lizzo was out here with her, you know, big body Benz is behind her, Listen. Monique was on the BET stage carrying. I also want to shout out two tons of fun. If we really going to take it back, take it back, take it back. That's your music history. Look that up. What? But that's my favorite uh, award show moment. What I appreciate about that moment is like to to do Beyonce in front of Beyonce I mean listen that that takes some some guts right and I was I loved it and she murdered it right like hair toss cap choreography the short little (laughs) skirts like it was fantastic I love that moment it's so good it's so good. Okay. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I kind of want to I kind of want to get into like the complex and complicado of this, right? It's not quite a fan and anti for for those of you who've been listening to the show for a while. Like we were trying to make this a fan and an anti, but it was just not really hitting. It's it is much more complex and complicado. Um, I've been mm-hmm. joking with Travel that I'm the straight man on this show. Not to be confused with mm-hmm. the heterosexual guy on this show, because that's a different Hate thing. That for you, friend. Listen, right? Not that, right? But like, <laughs> I recognize that, like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the one in this conversation that is coming to it a little with a little bit less experience in this conversation. You have obviously been kind of working mm-hmm. on this, this kind of these kinds of changes that have been happening at award shows. But when I'm thinking about the challenges that could come along with this, right? First of all, I know that there is a conversation for folks about degendering awards that really tends to skew toward men. I was looking at some data that said that if we look at the Oscars all the way up to 2015, when this this piece was written, that like 17% of nominees had been women, right? And like the number of women in the industry, whether we're talking about film or television or music or whatever, is significantly less, right? We talk about working in a male-dominated uh industry and i'm curious how the factor of men being so prominent in positions of power in voting in you know the trades and all that how does that affect the idea of mm-hmm. degendering the awards and it being a level playing field for women so i'm going to hit on your question directly uh in a moment but i think it's important to first say that the issue with gendered award categories, um, as many people see it, many non-binary people and other people, um, is that if you have gendered award categories, what then do we do with the non-binary folks, right? Mm. What category do they go in, right? What does... Uh, b- because you can't put Sam Smith in best male, you know, performance category. You can't put Emma Corrin in best lead actress category because those identifiers, right, do not describe them, right? And so there's a uh, and there's a history, right, of various award shows basically 
I guess you could say allowing, quote unquote, non-binary people to self-select which of the two gendered categories that they have to choose. Um, and various folks have have decided in various ways how to navigate that. Some folks have, you know, opted for um, actor, the actor category, because the actor label technically is a, you know, gender neutral um, term for actors, right? Um, and then you have other people who have completely um, opted out of consideration, right, for various entities. And then you also have folks who have at least been allowed to be considered, right, in both categories. Kelly Mantle is somebody who comes to mind. Um, uh, they're a gender queer performer, um, and they had a movie that came out a few years ago, um, and the Film Academy basically said that they could be considered for nomination by those committees um, in either category. Um, so that's how the Film Academy w worked away that around that at that time. Go ahead. I would imagine that having to self-select is kind of like the conversation we have about going to the bathroom and having to choose between and going out into the world and being misgendered and those kinds of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like it, 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 I wrote a piece about, um, for Extra Magazine about, um, uh, the passports, um, and, and wanting to go through the process of getting the gender neutral marker on, on my passport. Um, and part of the piece I talk about having to go to doctor's offices, having to go to the DMV, having to go to all of these places where they only have binary options. And so I'm forced to misgender myself, right? to seek out these services that we all are supposed to have access to. And so I think there is some correlation right here in terms of folks having to basically choose, right, one category over another. Um, and so I wanted to first say, right, that like that that is the a part core of, of this issue and why there's so much talk, right? Especially as we see more and more people are beginning to identify as non-binary, both in public visibility-wise, but also in your your local communities, right? And so we need to, to make sure that we um, have space for all of us to be accurately represented. Now, to your question about if... Um, if we degender awards and you have women um, competing up against men, that because of the isms and obias of our society, men will, you know, more often than not get recognized um, and the women will not. I would say in response to that, that the award show is not the issue, mm. right? Like the, the award category rather is not the issue there, right? There are these broader <laughs> issues that we need to be discussing about power, about you know who gets about about who gets who has green light power in the industry, about who gets to do certain types of movies, and ultimately when we're talking about award shows, about the ethos of your awards nominating and voting body, right? If you have a body, right, that is going to for whatever reason privilege more often than not men over women, or or vice versa, however the identities fall down, you got some other things that you really need to be worried about, in my estimation, right? And the awards category ends up being a Band-Aid on a much bigger issue, right? Because what we do know, to your point, right, is that oftentimes, right now, the only way Right. The only reason, right, we see women get on some of these stages is because of the gendered categories. Right. And so to me, in my head, it's like, oh, well, then maybe the voting body isn't, you know, equally yoked, if you will. <laughs> right. To think differently about who gets you know, platformed and who does not? And what can the organization do? What can the industry do? What can society do, right, to make those necessary changes as opposed to just throwing our hands up and saying, right, that it is okay that the only way women get on stage is be is for gendered categories, which if if I'm going to go a little step further, then I would say that gendered, sec gendered categories at award shows are sexist. I mean, I, I would say, like, 
society is sexist, right? Like the kind of way that we talk about diversity, well, equity, and inclusion when we're thinking about race, when we're thinking about gender, when we're thinking about sexuality, when we're thinking about all of these different things, right? Um, so many, so many of these uh, companies, even if we take a step back from awards and just kind of look at the conversation we've been having about diversity, equity, and inclusion around the world, or right, especially you know post post George Floyd. I find that we have a hard time with companies that just want to look better without being better, right? I think oftentimes, like, mm. companies want to be a part of the conversation about being better. They want to be able to put out a press release and say that they're doing better. They want to be able to tell their employees that, you know, we're doing X, Y, Z things, but, like, there's not a whole lot of interest in actually being better, right? And, like, degendering the mm -hmm. award is one of the steps right of, of being able to be more inclusive but when we're looking at the voting bodies as you started to touch on right if the voting body is predominantly male and white right like we've seen at the oscar specifically we've seen over the last few years them trying to bring in more people into the voting academy into the voting um, ranks and into the mm -hmm. academy those are the things that are like the bigger conversations that have to happen. And whether you're working at a hospital or working at a media company or working, you know, in a mine, the conversations that we have about being better versus looking better are more important than are the conversations about being better are more important than the conversations about like the things that we do that are that are just, you know, public facing. Yeah, I mean, and I wanted to mention, right, um, at the Brits this year, they had all men, they degendered last year, their their top award categories, they degendered them last year, and at the award show this year, uh, an Adele won uh, the first year that they degendered. This year, they had all men in the top category. Harry Styles won. I, we might have talked about it on the show. We might have been on break at this time. I can't remember. Um, but he dedicated his, you know, award when he, in his acceptance speech. He This was after the Beyonce uh, uh, mishap at the Grammys, by the way. Um, but he used part of his speech to, like, recognize women um, whose albums, you know, should have been in that conversation, who probably should have been um, nominated. And so I say that to say, you know, to me, that is the fact that all men were in that category in a year in which, you know, a number of, of our other artists, right, should have or could have been there um, based on the work that they produced. That is an indictment on that entity, hmm. that organization, those voters, the people, you know, the people part of that, that should not be an indictment on not, you know, gender neutral or, you know, degendering award show categories. All of this being said, okay, one of the things that I, I think is important to know is that how the collapsing of these categories, it does mean that less awards are giving out, given out, right? So Which like, on, on the one end, okay. Listen, that's that's one of the positives, right? The Oscars don't need to be three and a half hours long. The Is Grammys it a positive? Don't need, I, think, oh. I think it could be a positive. You're talking right? about the time. Listen, because, I mean, you and I have gone to a number of award shows even in the last week, right? Yes. And so I, I, they tend to be incredibly long, even if there's a handful of awards. Like, award shows are always too long. One of the things that we always talk about when I go to New York to host Vision is like, we are about a 90 minute show. We are tight, right? We're not trying to be here all night. Nobody wants to be sitting in these chairs or at these tables for hours and hours and hours. I mean, you and I have talked about this, you know, internally and, and out in public, like the, um, the awards that we do at NABJ at our national convention, way too damn long, right? Like you and I sat there, <laughs> we ate that chicken, you, you eat the mashed potato and it's like, we still got two more hours. Like, are we naming off all of these nominees? <laughs> like, what is happening? That is something that I'm constantly thinking about. But I also want to point out, like, you talked about the Brits degendering their awards and Adele winning and then uh, Harry Styles. And I, I could see someone being like, oh, well, like, if Adele won, right, then it's not a problem. And, like, an anecdotal outcome is not, you know, like a systemic mm -hmm. change, right? In the same ways when we see these companies mm -hmm. hire a black person in leadership, right? That does not mean that everything has been changed. When we see a, them, you know, put a woman as as president of whatever or leading whatever group, like we know that those kinds of like anecdotal changes or like an individual kind of change is not enough, but that is like a start. And so I, I think about even those kinds of things when we're seeing um, the results of the degendering of certain kinds of awards. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it makes me just think about like this this ongoing conversation about inclusion, diversity, whatever in in the industry. Um, there there was a study that came out um, at from, by, by USC by the folks who do the inclusion um, stuff over at USC, uh, Dr. Stacy. Um, evaluating the eight years at the Academy Awards immediately before Oscar So White um, and the eight years since Oscar So White. I encourage you all to check it out and read it if you are uh, interested and intrigued. Um, But I want to note how, like, the issue of inclusion is, like, I feel like you you always have to be on the side of inclusion, right? If you, because there, there are people, there are celebrities, there are folks out here saying that we should not be degendering awards, right? Saying that um, they're concerned about what it will mean, right, for women um, and other, I imagine, um, identified folks getting the recognition that they're due. And I think that that concern is a valid one. I want to, I want to be clear about that. Right. Um, but if we are legitimately and seriously committed to, you know, this promised land that we say we are, right, then we need to accurately, make sure that the things and the changes and the shifts that we're talking about making, right, are 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 really solving the issue and not just, you know, painting over it. So I know that you've worked on a couple of the award shows degendering themselves. And I'm curious, like, what the challenges are that come up or like the conversations that are that people wouldn't expect were part of the 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 way that we're thinking about this. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the 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 main question, the main conversation is the point that we've been discussing thus far. Other things that have been thought about and considered is like, you know, if you degender if you degender the awards and we're collapsing everybody into the, the same categories, does that mean it does it stay at five nominees? Right. Do we open up to to more nominees, considering that it is, you know, um, multi-gendered um, and at the Independent Spirit Awards, that's what they did. Normally, in years previous to this year, um, it was five nominees per category in the acting category, the now degendered acting categories. They had 10 nominees. Um, I believe in this on the film side, um, the lead actor category had more women than men nominated. Uh, There were no non-binary identified folks in either category, but it had more women than men nominated. And then in the supporting category, it had more men than women nominated. Um, Out of the total categories, I think I mentioned this earlier, three of the uh, acting uh, awards went to women, all women of color. Um, Quinta Brunson, Ayo from The Bear, Michelle Yeoh from Everything Everywhere All at Once, and then the supporting went to a man. So, right, you know, this is their first year. And I will note the Spirit Awards has a nominating committee, right? And the nominating committee is charged with, you know, doing whatever they need to do, right, or want to do to recognize the top performances of that particular year and then the broader film independent body votes on those nominees right different award shows have their different setups so as as the film critic on this show i'm curious because we saw in uh, i don't know probably the last five years um sorry i wanted to make sure that we gave you the moment for the shoulder moment that just happened (laughs) for the people watching on youtube (laughs) Um, I'm curious because we saw the the best picture expand from five films to ten, right? And people felt a way about that. Um, some people Oscars. were excited about mm-hmm. it, right? Some people were were upset about it. How do you look at the expanding of the number of nominees in a category when we think about best picture? But now when we're degendering awards, does the expanding and and bringing in more people, having ten nominees, how does that feel for you? I love it because, I mean, here's the thing. Actors, Hollywood, they always talk about the art, right? 
they always talk about the art and the craft. Um, my question is always, is the art and the craft different for men versus women versus non-binary and trans people, you know, um, who might not identify as men or women? Um, I, I don't know because I'm not an actor, actress, or act they rest. Um, but act they rest. <laughs> but I, I, I would need imagine, you to start using that more. I would Im- <laughs> I would imagine that it feels damn good, right? To be um to be actually I know based on Ayo, Ayo from The Bear who won um the supporting, I believe supporting actor in a TV role or whatever at the Independent Spirit Awards, um, has talked about how cool it was, right, for her to be in a category up against her co-star, right, and to to win, right? And what that means, one, for the work that she's done, but also for their relationship and all of that. Um, and <laughs> And I just imagine what that would do for a person, what that would do for our industry to be like, yeah, this woman had the best performance of the year. Period. Hands Period. down. Not the Done. best woman's performance of the year, but the best performance of the year. You know, I, I just I just think that um, I don't think, I will note, the there are some film critics groups that have also degendered their awards who have decided to do two, they did 10 nominees and they did two winners. Um, and you know, in in those categories, I don't know how I feel about all that. I was gonna say that um, feels, but you know, like, I'm not in those organizations, so it don't matter. That feels like one of those give everybody a trophy kind of things. Like we have two winners, and like, is it two guys, two girls, a guy and a girl? Like, then what's the <laughs> point of like degendering it, right? If we're trying to, I don't know. That's that's interesting to me. I I I I think that this is one of those conversations that is really going to end up being a more generational thing than anything because I think that we're going to see more and more mm. um people feeling comfortable with the idea of opening up the ways that we think about this, right? And I think so much of it is about tradition, which is never a reason to keep something in my opinion, right? Just because we've always done it that way. Right. Um that that is the the thinking that tends to annoy me the most. And so when I think about this, I'm like, okay, well we're thinking about this in a different way and we're trying to embrace it and I'm 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 curious how we will continue to see this grow over the years cuz I know that the Grammys degendering in 2012 I don't even think about it anymore right like best new artist Mm -hmm. best Mm -hmm. song best whatever and like Mm -hmm. and and i also don't think that people think enough about how few awards are actually gendered right i was um i I was reading uh, a little bit earlier today and the piece i was talking about that came out in 2015 when we were having some analysis around gender um in awards was talking about how it says, quote, only in the field of costume design do we see women actually surpassing men. In this category, they constitute 55% of candidates and 58% of the winners. The second category where women score relatively well is the award for makeup. It says in that category, women make up a whopping 32% of the winners. Third place for female presence. the Oscars, right? Correct. Um, Third place for female presence goes to documentary awards where women have been 24% of the nominees and 23% of the winners. Um, Again, this data going up to uh, 2015. And so as we look at that, it's, it's like, okay, there's definitely something to consider here. I remember... Uh, a few years ago, the the best directing award um, going to uh, the Hurt Locker director. You will know her name better than me, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. or not? Bigelow, uh, big Catherine Bigelow. Thank you. Um, and like I, I remember them them saying like she's the first woman to win this award, and I'm like, in 90 years, like it's absurd, right? Like (laughs) how many women have gotten to direct a film like that was even considered for an Oscar, right? When we think about these kinds of things, like we don't have gender for costuming. We don't have gender for directing. We don't have gender for editing and sound mixing and all these other things. We only do that in the acting categories. And I think if we can release that a little bit and not be so tight about it, um, we we can see some progress. And I'll just, last thing, you know, I'll note that you know, in this moment where we've been talking about, you know, greater diversity and inclusion, um, we've also seen in a number of those, like, you know, below the line categories that are already degendered, the ones that were, you know, perhaps more exclusionary 
uh, or exclusive um, uh, of women in particular, um, we've seen those categories begin to shift and change. Like I think of Joy McMillan, who edited, um, she was an editor on Moonlight um, and then edited If Beale Street Could Talk. Um, she was nominated. Um, I I believe was the first black woman editor nominated um, in, in that category for that film. Um, but so we've, we've seen some, some inroads happen. Obviously Ruthie Carter, who is nominated in the costuming category again this year for the black Panther sequel. She was the um, first black woman, I believe to win that the costuming category for black Panther one. Um, and so like, we're seeing shifts and half happening. I just wanted to, you know, note that. But you're right; there are other categories that don't have this this gender um, most categories kind of stipulation. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, yes, m- I, most categories. Do you want to explain what below the line is before I tell the people we're going to break? Oh, below the line means you know folks who are not on camera for the most part. They're like you know your crew. You know the pe- the people who make a movie happen that you never hear about. Those are the below the line folks. Yeah, I I did a, a Google like I know what it means, but I'm like, oh, where does that come from? It comes from budgeting and like the way that certain things are above a certain line and below a certain line or whatever that means. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. We want to know hear from y'all and know what you think about this on social media. You can hit us up using the hashtag Fantai Fam. You can use Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok at Fantai Podcast. You can hit us in the comments on YouTube. There's a plenty of different places for you to be able to tell us what the hell you think about what we got wrong. Uh, you can find us on all of those different mm-hmm. platforms. Excited to have y'all uh, joining us on YouTube now for the second episode. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're getting into why y'all hate us so much and our listener feedback. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. Oh, I hope they've got the bread bowl. Have you seen the bread bowl at this place? Mm-hmm. Good evening. Welcome to Maximum Fun. Have you been here before? It's her first time. Very good. Might I recommend our special? Oh, please. Can I interest you in the Max Fun Drive? I'm told they're cooking up something quite extraordinary this year. I've heard about this. With limited time thank you gifts for new and upgrading members? That's right. <laughs> we'll take it. How would you like your episodes? Uh, can I get them excellent with new Boko on the side? Oh, are there live stream events? Absolutely. You know, if you're interested in events, Meetup Day is returning. What? Oh, you're going to love Meetup Day. It's the best. Okay, let me make sure I have everything. Max Fun Drive 2023 with limited time thank you gifts, live stream events, Meetup Day, excellent episodes, and of course, new bonus content. Sounds perfect. Great. We'll get it started and it'll be ready in two weeks, March 20th. Oh, can we also get a couple of waters? Of course. Where am I? On Maximum Fun. What do you want? A podcast miniseries about The Prisoner. Whose side are you on? That would be telling, but okay, I'm on my own side. It's one of my favorite ever TV shows. We want a podcast on it. A Prisoner podcast. You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. Who are you? I'm Elliot Kalin. Who is number one? Jesse Thorne. But you are John Hodgman. I am not a Prisoner podcaster. I am a free man. <laughs> are you okay? Elliot, are you all right? Okay, I'll watch it. All four episodes of Bee Potting You are out now. Welcome back, beautiful people. We're going to get into our listener feedback segment. This is our opportunity to read out your letters, your thoughts about, you know, past episodes, things that we've said, things you want us to say, all of that. We have got an email here from Murray. This is in response to one of our uh, Fanti mini, what is it? What did I call them? Mini, mini sods, you know, um, during during the hiatus um so murray says hi hi to both of you longtime listener of the show and finally had to send an email in wish it could have been about something fun i also doubt i'm the first one to reach out about this after your last episode but i fully understand the importance of oprah as a cultural touchstone and the importance of her as a black feminine power but at the same time i think this episode would have been the perfect time to bring up loving what she represents over a lot of what she platformed Dr. Phil got his start there, and it's coming out that he sends teens to extremely abusive rehabs, allegedly, because, you know, we we journalists, so we, we got to slide that in, you know. 
Um, but there are reports about that. Then there's Dr. Oz, the OG anti-vaxxer, Jenny McCarthy, and even cult leaders like John of God, who sexually abused and manipulated women in Brazil, plus so much more. I mean, how much of her money comes from middle-aged women buying junk diet pills? A whole hell of a lot of it. Overall, I don't think anyone with that much power can be seen in a totally positive light. No heroes over $1 billion because, you know, they had to do some shady shit to get that billion. Bill billion? Billion. Um, this kind of feedback about Oprah always pisses me off because it's like, Dr. Phil did something 20 years later that you didn't like, so it's Oprah's fault? Like, how the fuck does that even make sense, right? Murray, with love and respect, like, I hear this often about, like, well, Dr. Oz is doing blah, blah, blah. And it's like, if I introduced you to someone and then 25 years later they did some asshole bullshit, is that my fault? Like, no, right? Like, we're not getting rid of, you know, John Legend because Kanye West has gone crazy, right? Like, we're not getting rid of NeNe Leakes because she was on The Apprentice, right? <laughs> and people, some people met her there. We're not, like, canceling, I mean, mind you, we're getting rid of Donald Trump for other reasons, right? But, like, we're not getting rid of, we're not upset with people that introduce us to other people because of their introduction and people go left to the other side. This frustrates me a lot because I feel like we hear this all the time about Oprah, about specifically about Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil um, and like them becoming, you know, a different kind of personality than we were used to. But that's not Oprah's fault. Right. Like, I don't think Oprah did that. I don't think Oprah platformed them when she did because of the things that they were doing 25 years later or that they would be expected to do 25 years later. She brought them on because they had really great insight and were actually really powerful. And like, I think this kind of critique always ignores all of the good work that came out of that, right? Like people's lives being changed and, and improved and the ways that we can, you know, uh, the ways that we can look at what has happened for those from those people. But like, these white men, these, these white people specifically, right? Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, Jenny McCarthy going and doing other shit that Oprah, the other piece of that, right? Oprah does not necessarily even have those views, right? Like Oprah did not go and endorse Dr. Oz when he ran for Senate in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. She actually went and ran for the person who went against him, his opponent, right? Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil's um, career has really, you know, kind of launched after him being on Oprah, but like, him being a person that people don't like today is not Oprah's fault. So like, I, I reject this whole thing. Actually, Well, I, I would say that. Well, one, I think it is a, it is a, it is a historically accurate, you know, uh, statement to say that, you know, Oprah has had various people on her show right, in the past, who had, have, or have gone on to have various thoughts, opinions, and do various shit that, you know, Oprah herself does not endorse, that we as fans of Oprah would not endorse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I think that is a sure. historically accurate statement. I think it's also important to note that, you know, a little bit of what you're saying, which is like trying to hold this black woman accountable for the foolishness that these white people and whomever else is going out here in the world and doing and conducting and all of that is a choice. Um, however, I do there's this last line about no heroes over a billion dollars because you know they had to do some shady shit to get that billion is an interesting statement to me because... That presupposes, right, that to be that level of successful, you have to, um, you know, there's some collateral damage, basically, right, in, in, in getting to that level. Um, and that feels accurate to me, right? Like, you a billionaire? Somebody, you know, had to go through some shit for you to get up to that billion. And this in, this includes um the Carters, this includes Miss Renana, this include you know this includes everybody, right? Uh oh. Rihanna's now how did I get in it? I I, I like saying listen, Renana. Get your life. Right. But this but this includes all of them, right? And in addition to, you know, the Elon Musks and, you know, 
all all of the the white folks as well, right? Um, and we were just talking about the other day about um, Beyonce last week and them Tiffany diamonds. Like, um, I mean, and you know, I, all of the to talk be fair, like we've done hundred and sixty ish episodes of this ep- of this show now, and like if someone who was a guest on our show went out and said some wild shit in the world tomorrow, that's not our fault. Right. Like the idea of that being on us because we had them as a guest is just completely frustrating to me because it's it's completely um, it, it it's just ridiculous. And so, like, again, Murray with love, like I fully disagree. Yeah. Last thing I'll say. Um, well, I don't, like I said, I don't, I, don't, I don't quite fully disagree, but, you know, I, I got some contention, you know, very fanti about it. All right. So we're going to move to a voice memo that my bestie Bianca um, sent me last night um, that felt timely. So I, I wanted to play it um, to hear us respond to. I have a fan tie question for tomorrow. Um, so we are getting reports of uh, deaths from Glorilla's concert that happened in Rochester, New York. Um, there was a, apparently some sort of incident there and people were afraid and there was a stampede and now two people have, are dead and other people are injured. And this is kind of following like what happened with Astro World last year and um, Travis is still like on trial for that or going through the legal proceeding for that. So my question for you all, knowing that you are, um, you just came from the Usher concert and that you're both going to go see Beyonce later on this year, does this make you nervous at all about going to concert venues with tons of people and uh, what may happen if there is panic induced? So Bianca just outed all my business. Um, yes, I was you at the Usher concert week. in Vegas uh, last week and got my life. All um, right. You did. You saw that. Remember, I? you were telling okay, us I in forgot. the future past for going tomorrow, <laughs> yesterday. Um, so I have not made the decision if I'm, I, I, I should say that I won. They never emailed me back about a code for getting Beyonce tickets, which I took really personally one conversation. So I technically don't have tickets yet, but I do feel really confident that I'm going to be there. But with an asterisk, right? Like I'm actually, I've been trying not to say this out loud, but like you asked specifically about Beyonce and like, I'm really concerned about this tour, right? Like this album, Renaissance specifically, these people are going to be at this concert high as a fucking kite right everybody not everybody but there're going to be a lot of people on a lot of things at this award show i mean at this at this concert and i keep thinking about how we keep seeing like more instances of like people interrupting concerts people going up on stage people grabbing people and doing wild shit and like if i'm very honest i'm actually concerned about what to expect at the beyonce concert with people losing their fucking minds and so the part of what we were talking about was like you have tickets down out on the ground where you'd be standing up Um, you know, for hours and hours. And I'm like, I'm not interested in being in like the standing room spot. Like I get that it's very close to the stage and you can see, you know, the sweat on her brow or whatever, but like standing there for hours and hours with people who are going to be moving around and bouncing and shrugging and all that shit. I'm, I'm, I'm unsure. Like I would love to be in a box somewhere that is catered, right. Looking over the, the thing with the screen, like, I don't know that I, I need to be that close because I'm I'm concerned about what that's going to be like. Um, I I think that people are going to be on the same substances that they would have been on for any concert. Um, and I I'm the type of person automatically when I go to to spaces. I'm immediate any space, a restaurant, a movie theater, a, a concert hall, an award show. I'm looking Listen. where my exits at. Okay, who? who how, what's the e? I'm. That's just me. That's just me naturally. You know, that's how I was raised by Melanie Carter. Okay, right. Um, and so that's all. I've always been alert in that particular way. Um. I have not thought about the potential for, you know, panic um, for whatever reason at any of these things. Um, To be quite honest, because I I go to too many large group things. And if I'm always concerned and worried about the potential of 
some sort of traumatic situation happening, I'll never be able to experience and enjoy, you know. So what, I want to be what clear. Is, what is there? Um, and I'm so not interested in that. To be clear, that. I don't mean I feel this way every time I go somewhere, right? Like, I don't feel that. Um, I mean, there's always like a concern of like, you never know what could happen, right? Mm-hmm. But like this concert particularly, I'm just I'm I'm very interested. I would love to have a conversation with the Parkwood team about like how are y'all thinking about security differently this year, right? Because in the last few years, especially um, I would say the last three years, maybe just pre pre pandemic and then into now, like we've seen people do wild shit at live shows, right? Like getting up on stage and and that kind of thing. And like, now mind you, Julius will be there, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Well, so that, let me, that, that's what I was about to say, right? That's what I was about to say. Our girl Beyonce has already been through the, you know, the people jumping up on stage, the people grabbing her, her hair getting caught in the in the fan, her falling downstairs. She's navigated so much already. I I'm not con- I I feel like there's a lot of setup already with Beyonce based on her prior experiences that that builds some sort of distance. A lot of these instances where we see people jumping up on stage and whatnot, it's it's because they're in they're in a type of venue that Beyonce would not be in. You know? Um, I mean that's no shame. It is all to you, no shame. Uh, that's something that comes to mind, right? But I d- I do think that that it is a legitimate concern, right, for the people for whom it's a legitimate concern for, right? That these these are things these are things that we now have to fucking think about in this country because of all of, of the various different reasons that we have to think about them and you know life doesn't have to be that way it is time for us to get into our dishonorable mentions these are the people or things that caught our attention this week that deserve a call out either for their good or for their stupid travel what you got for us all righty, I have got um two, three, three things, three things I want to mention. First and foremost, do your taxes. If you ain't done your taxes yet, like me, I am, you know, that TurboTax reminder popping up in your inbox, even though you haven't had TurboTax in a decade at this point, but I'm popping up in your inbox to remind you, go on do them taxes, okay? So I just want to say that that's a reminder, mainly for myself, not for y'all. Not but you maybe putting you your reminders in the show for us, well. so when you listen back, you'll be like, "Oh <laughs> shit, on Thursday." <laughs> oh my, who does that? Cut it out! Cut it out! Okay, I wanted to give. <laughs> I also wanted to give an honorable mention to this doll company that I found on tech, TikTok called Healthy Roots Dolls. It's a toy company founded by Yalitza Jean Charles that creates dolls and storybooks that empower young girls and represent the beauty of our diversity. That's a quote. Their first doll is named Zoe, and it's a doll that aims to teach Black kids about their natural hair. So, like, it's a doll that, like, you can use actual product on its hair. You can wash it. You can style it. Um, Everything. And I thought it, I had never seen a doll like this. And I remember the dolls that I and the people around me used to play with back in the day. You call yourself trying to put some spritz Baby. in that motherfucker. You're going to be very a upset. Whole situation. <laughs> when she dries. Okay. And, and uh, God forbid uh, you put some heat on it now. Listen, right? Listen, <laughs> do, listen, don't do that because it, it will melt. Okay. It will melt. And last but not least, you mentioned, Jarrett, that we attended the Better Brothers Los Angeles Truth Awards um, last week. And to catch the people up, I was asked to be a presenter of one of their awards to a wonderful organization here in Los Angeles called the Unique Women's Coalition. They are a Black trans-led organization. They do great work in the community for the girls, okay? Um, I was asked to present alongside Ashley Marie Preston, who is a wonderful advocate, activist, writer, fabulous person. Hit her up, follow her, all of the things. It is important that when you bring trans people into your space, especially as a Black gay organization, 
that you treat us right. That you make sure that we are taken care of. That you make sure that we feel the love that you say you are supposed to be extending toward us. And I would just say that we did not feel that love at Better Brothers Los Angeles Truth Awards last, the, last week. Um, and it was very unfortunate, especially as a former honoree myself. I received the Passing the Torch Award a number of years ago from this organization. Um, it was not okay. Um, Cheryl Lee Ralph, who is the patron saint of the organization, also did not have a seat, um, which is also not okay. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, I don't usually do dishonorable mentions, you know, I feel like, because I be trying to keep it up, you know, but, uh, oh, we on YouTube now. Somebody is going to give that my God today. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to, to, to note that and put it on wax and put it out there that when you are bringing trans people, black trans people specifically into your space, especially if you are also members of the queer community, um, and even more so if you're not, but especially if you're part of the queer community, you got to do right by us. You just got, you got to, you got to do right by us. Um, or otherwise I would rather stay at home on my couch. Thank well, you so much. I do want to, I do just want to acknowledge that like the issues that they had seemed like there was like some seating and table issues. Like they might have what it seemed like, and I don't know, I haven't I haven't talked to them, but it seemed like they might have oversold, right? And had more tickets sold than they had seats. Because it I, I do think it's important that we point out that it wasn't just like the trans and non-binary folks that didn't have seats. And you talked about Shirley Ralph and like other people. There was like a there was a seating issue. And I it seemed like there might have been like a talent that a, a uh, talent getting seated issue, right? People who were on the program and things like that didn't get their seats assigned correctly or something like that. I know that that was a nightmare for them. And so I, I just, I, I, my heart kind of like broke for them because I was like, I know this was not an intentional situation, but it was also like a bad situation to have happened at an award show. But okay. Um, I want to give an honorable mention to uh, a couple of things. Number one, comedian some more. Um, I was on Netflix uh, looking for the Chris Rock. Um, what? What, what what was the face? What what, what, what was the face? No, what was the face? No, because we're all, we're on YouTube now, so people saw the face. Keep what just happened? I know, right? I made it. I made it, and then I was like, I, I was like, God damn it, we on we on the camera now. No, I I would like you to finish. I would like you to finish your honorable mention, and then I will respond. So I was on Netflix to um for whatever I was looking for the Chris Rock thing, and then other stuff, and like I saw some more had a special, and I was like, oh shoot, some more has a special. Um, and I remember some more from, you know, years and years of like comic view back in the day and her own standup specials and the queen of comedy and all those different things. And so I was excited to see her, um, her new special is called queen chandelier on Netflix. And it, it is funny. It is like, she is giving what some more gives. If you're a fan of some more, you know, her, her brand of comedy. Um, it comes up to the line of problemasia a couple of, in a, in a moment that made me a little unsure um but it is i was excited to see some more more than anything because i hadn't seen her in a long time and i know monique has a special coming out on netflix so like i, I was excited about some of the black folks that we saw what did you want to say about some more um off of your face so i would say not only does she tap dance up to the line but i believe she is on the line and crosses okay. it personally i we give so much grace um as we should to people coming to figure out like how to like articulate or talk about um um identity transgender pronoun etc issues um and i would really love for folks to not say anything at all if you don't if you don't got, if you if you if you're not interested in doing the work necessary as you're putting together your special to appropriately gender somebody who you want us to believe that you're not um um yeah. against right you want to talk about the issue uh, this well, is in reference go ahead go ahead 
I was going to say this is in reference to a, a, one, a joke or series of jokes um, or discussion points, I should say, um, around um, um, the Wade unions and um, their child, um, Zaya. Um, and you're right. Samore is a comedy legend. I also watched the special off of the strength of her being a comedy legend. Um, but you know, she misgenders Zaya, um, um, over and over. Um, and yeah, I I saw it and I thought to myself, like, I wonder what the level of awareness is here and how much of it is intentional and not, not that it makes it okay or better. Um, maybe better, but not okay. Um, but like, I, it did, it did strike me as like, interesting um chris rock has a moment talking about uh caitlin jenner that i was like "Eh." you know like i i I do i do wonder about like how we talk to their generation about these things right where like they we are seeing people who are not used to like this conversation or it's a new conversation to them even if it's an old conversation that's been around for a long time um and like I, yeah, so I've been thinking about that a good amount with Chris Rock and some more. I just, I just, I, I, I am not interested in the generational conversation for comedians who have taken the time, right, to write out their jokes and to weave together the narratives that, like, you know, comedians do work, right, before they get up on these stages. Part of that work could be, I don't know, novel idea engaging with members of a particular community or sensitivity folks or whatever, right. To ensure that you're able to still get the jokes off. Right. Cause that's, cause I want to be clear. We can still get the jokes off by properly misgendering, by properly gendering people. Right. Like it, it, it doesn't have to be an either or. And oftentimes it always feels like, you know, it's presented as an either or, and it just doesn't, have to be that way but i know we got to get the hell up out of here so what's your next honorable mention last thing i want to mention is i believe i've mentioned this on the show before but it's like something that every month brings me a little bit of joy it's called the just like me book box uh it is a a box of books that um i have gotten for my my nephew um and every month he gets a box of books that are written by black and brown creators they tend to be incredibly inclusive they curate the box of different things and you can go to justlikemebox.com um to to register and like subscribe to it you get a couple of different books every month and like um now i'm getting videos from um from my nephew like reading the book and like i love this book it was so good um and stuff like that so it's been really really cute and if you're looking for something like that for the little person in your life um you can uh, go to just like me box just like me box.com uh to subscribe that's it all righty now it's time for Black history is happening every day. Oh, yes, honey, black history is happening every day. Unless you're the Oscars, where only one black woman has ever won the lead actress Oscar. That was Halle Berry in 2002 for Monsters Ball. And considering that won't be changing this year, because no Black women have been nominated in the lead actress category this year, Viola Davis, My Woman King, and Danielle Dadweiler from Till were seen as frontrunners for nominations at a point, but that did not quite happen. So to mark the occasion of the Oscars happening this weekend, I thought we should revisit Halle Berry's acceptance speech. What a great moment. Holly Berry, like I remember Holly Berry in this moment. Like it was it was a big moment for a lot of folks. And like I remember I also love like if you watch the full clip, you can see like the faces in the audience. Um and like it was mm-hmm. it was such a fantastic moment. So shout out to Holly Berry. My favorite part about it is her naming like the black women who were like her contemporaries at the time, Vivica A. Fox. She mentioned the the legends, right? Diane Caro um as well i just i love that she like used the moment to also like name some other black women who either should have been on that stage could have been on that stage that stood um alongside her and before her um so you know a little a little multiple black history is happening every day because what 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 
wouldn't it be everything to see Vivica A. Fox on the Oscar stage? I mean, come on now. I mean, yeah. come on now. Set it off. Did you you remember her from Set It Off? I was come thinking on. like which what's role from Vivica Fox would I put? You don't remember I, what's I, the I'm procedure? Think, well, I'm like, is Set It Off her her Oscar performance? I'm I'm debating. It might like, be. Because what else you got? Here's the gag. It's certainly not my favorite Vivica performance, uh, which is uh, two can play that game because I love that movie. Period. I know every word of that Period. movie, but like watching it in 2023, <laughs> I'm like, this relationship is low key problematic, and so are you. Um, and like the way that they act in this movie, I'm like, oh, I could never nowadays. Anyway, shout out to all of them and um, all of the the fantastic folks that will be winning Oscars this weekend. We're excited to see uh, what will happen, even if Viola won't. I, I will also say you bringing up that for um, Hallie made me think about Viola because I always think about Viola winning the Emmy and like jumping up and like mm. hugging Taraji in that moment and mm -hmm, Taraji being mm -hmm. so excited for her. Um, I love, I feel like black women do that uniquely with each other in a way that I really, really Absolutely. love and appreciate and always like gives me goosebumps. So I, I appreciate that. We we have been way over time. We appreciate y'all so much for uh, joining us on YouTube, on your platforms, uh, on your podcasting platforms, and wherever you get the show. We really appreciate it. If you want to check us out on YouTube, you can go to fantipodcast.com. If you have a comment or suggestion about this week's show, we're at fantipodcast on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Use the hashtag fantifam, or you can shoot us an email at fanti at maximumfun.org. If you would like to help us make this show, okay, you got a couple extra dollars you like to support, be part of the Fanti Fam, you can do that by joining Maximum Fun at maximumfun.org slash join. As always, our music is brought to you by the one and only Grammy Award winning Corice. That's C-O-R dot E-C-E, wherever you get Slay Word, the audio. He's got a new song out with the legendary, the iconic Honey Dijon. Okay, so check that out. Our graphics are by Ashley Wynn and the folks over at Moon House Creative. Our editor is Anne-Marie Huber and our producer is Palmira Muniz. Our senior producer is Laura Swisher. <laughs> this is a production of Maximum Fun.